Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I wanted to take a, at the discussion that kind of kicked off with Big Daddy Linux's channel on Friday. At the tail end of it, the panel got off onto how are we going to get more people into Linux? Will the desktop ever take off? And people started talking about a redesign and so forth that we needed. So that's what we're going to talk about today right after this. I think what I want to do is to do what I always do, is take a look back where we've been, where we're at right now, and some ideas on what we ought to do in the future. But before we go there, TFIR had a chat with Linus Torvalds, I think it was about three months ago. There's a video of it, the full length of it. I'll include that in the uh, description section below so that you can go find that. I don't want to use videos from other people, and it, I just don't think that's right. Um, unless, of course, you have permission to do that, and I and I I don't, so I, I'm not going to use their video. But I did I did borrow some of the quotes out of it. And TFIR, the interviewer, asked Linus. He said the desktops are still now well, you know. And what I think he meant by that was they're not being used, and uh, they're, they're not popular. They're not bringing in hundreds of thousands of users in droves away from Windows and uh, Mac OS to use Linux. Linux replied, well, one day. Uh, and then he thought for a minute, and he said, well, you know, Chromebooks and Android are really the paths for the desktop. And the reason why he says that is because the Linux Foundation is, is concentrated on server products and cloud. That's where the corporations that are contributing to the Linux Foundation can make money. And so, of course, that is going to be their keen focus and, and where they're going to put their efforts. But he said further, I, he said, I wish we had a, that we were better at and had a single dis, a desktop that went across all the distributions. He said, that, well, you know, there's been some progress here, but, it's, it, it, but this really isn't a kernel issue, and it's, it's more of a pain in the backside for me personally because he does use the desktop for development. I mean, you, you can't test a Linux kernel without a desktop. Uh, trying to test on Chromebook and Android isn't going to fly. <laughs> but uh, he did say that he thought, he went on and added later, that fragmentation of the desktop he thought had held some users back. From coming over to Linux, you know, because there's a lot of choices. And that contributes to the perception that Linux has a steep learning curve in order to use it, is really what I think he meant by that. Of course, Linus probably would say something different, but I think that's what he meant by that. So, <laughs> if you want to really see some really bad user interfaces, this was one of the first ones. This is an IBM 401 uh, programming board. And uh, I, I did run into this in my life. I, we, I did not, I'm, I'm not that old to use an IBM 401, but we did have some old 401 unit record equipment that was in our computer center that we used from time to time. It wasn't certainly our main processing machine, but <laughs> we did have this antiquated thing in the back room. And I think the only thing that I ever used it for was to you know, do a merge sort on cards. And, and it basically was intelligent. It, I could take in three different decks of cards and then collate them uh, into uh, a, a single stack. So uh, the program would allow me to do that. But you had to basically wire all the instructions that you wanted in the program. And, and, and all the steps are on there for the program. It's just that it was all done at once. <laughs> and so if you made a mistake, usually what happened was you had to unplug the board and start over. Was, or somebody grabbed your board and reprogrammed it for something that they needed and didn't bother to tell you, and then you pick it up. Put, well, anyway, bad deal. <laughs> my, my first exposure to a graphical user interface was this one. This is Play-Doh 4. Uh, it was uh, a plasma display uh, on, uh, on a uh, machine that had basically called the Cave. That was the terminal made by Magnavox. They called it the Cave because it was basically hollow. There was a, in the top part of the machine, there was a microfiche reader where you could put 35 millimeter slides. And those would shine down and to a mirror and then back up through the screen. The screen was a, was a plasma display made by Corningware. 
and it was transparent. So any image you put through the back would display on the uh, on the back of, on, on the machine with the text laid over the top. It was kind of cool for the time, kind of primitive, but it worked. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, it, it did have a touch screen. Now the one up here that the lady is using is a prototype, but uh, the later versions of it in the actual machine itself were along the sides here, and that was a 16 by 16 uh, array. Not great, but enough to make you know some some selections on the screen. Remember, this is back in 73. It did have a full screen editor though, and uh, it was a very good editor. Uh, it did have some multimedia, it had audio, and it, it had the ability to do uh, some primitive voice generation and also some primitive music generation, which one of the guys by the name of Gooch uh, managed to actually get it to do a, a, do a pretty good job with what it had uh, with that. And uh, it had email and it had instant messaging, it had uh, forums. Uh, that were more like a social media group. It also had a newspaper, and there was a lot of other things that that, that, that that system had. But one of its faults was, not only was the terminal expensive, it required a supercomputer to run it, which was, uh, at the time, a CDC 6400 and a Cyber 73. Yeah, that's going to get expensive. So, anyway, my first real job, this is what I was, that I was greeted with day one. <laughs> It was uh, hand coding uh, COBOL onto coding forms, which you handed over to a key puncher. And they used this, this machine down here, the IBM, I think it was a 129 or one or something, that, that they would then put onto, they would code each one of those lines on a card. <laughs> and then they would hand it to a verifier. And they would make sure that what you had written was on the card. And then you would take this, this card deck, into the machine room up here. And then you would compile it. And then you would either get some coding errors or you'd get runtime errors, and then you would go back and rinse and repeat until it was working. Not a fun experience, <laughs> especially when the machine, this, this machine was a single user uh, machine, so you had to wait for somebody else if they were running a job <laughs> before you could get into to do whatever you needed to do. So not a pleasant experience at all. But in 1968, Douglas Engelbart had given the mother of all demos, and uh, Douglas invented the mouse. So uh, that was his thing. Uh, he, he actually created that. Um, but it used, uh, this demo he was showing had full screen editing. He could copy and paste text from one place to another. He could move it around on the screen and, 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 and reorder his lists. He could delete stuff with the mouse and uh, so forth. Now, I'm not quite certain if I can, yeah, there we go. I'm not quite certain what this part right here was, but uh, but anyway, I'll leave the link for the demo uh, below so you can, if you're interested, you can watch it. It's, uh, I guarantee you that it's, you'll probably find it pretty dry, but, but anyway, at the time, it was pretty amazing stuff. Um, again, that was before my time. But uh, in 1981, uh, the Xerox Star was released, and that was the first commercial computer to use a graphical user interface. That is the machine. I don't know if it was the Alto. They, Xerox had an Alto machine, which was internal. I don't know if that's the one they saw or whether they saw the Star, but I do know that Steve Jobs and Bill Gates drove down to uh, Xerox Park, got a demo of the machine and this particular user interface, uh, and both of them went back and developed products. Uh, Jobs went back and developed the Lisa, and then later the Macintosh, and Bill Gates went back and developed Windows. So uh, there was also outgrowth from that. There was Windows NT, and there was also OS2, uh, which was the same product at one point. And then uh, Unix and Linux, of course, came out with X11, which had uh, some <laughs> similarities between that. Uh, the there was a number of graphical user interfaces that rode on top of X11, and still do. Uh, so even back then, but they were primitive by today's standards. Today, however, we have a lot of choices as to which desktop we want to use. This video is not about here use this one because it's the best. No, I'm not going to tell you to do that. Uh, I, I have never been that way my whole entire life because every one of us are different. We all have different needs. 
Some of us are content creators. Some of us are developers. Some of us are just interested in getting email and going out and getting to the web. So uh, depending upon what your needs are, that's going to drive your choice of the uh, graphical user interface. And since you have so many to choose from, that's part of the confusion, right? Which one is going to be best for me? And the only way you can really determine that is to try it. Uh, and that is what Linus was talking about, that that may have held some users back. Well, if I have to go and evaluate all these things, can't somebody just tell me which is best for what this, 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 and this that I want to do? <laughs> yeah, everybody has an opinion. And unfortunately for you, that will and most likely always be wrong. Only you can really make the opinion of, of the choice of which desktop you, will work for you. Um, there, now, not only are there desktop interfaces, there are also Windows managers. And Windows managers hark all the way back to X11. Uh, the uh, um, ones I have here, out of the, now I counted 48. There might be more. Uh, but <laughs> when I was doing the, the video today, I, I did count 48 of them. There's a lot of Windows managers for Linux. So if you think the desktop environment is confusing, the Windows managers are even more confusing. These are generally text-based, and they divide up the uh, screen into different windows of text. So if you're a developer uh, or a scripter, that environment might be more uh, to your liking. If you, you know, if you're a minimalist and you don't want a lot of, uh, you know, the candy that's on the screen, the Windows managers might be the right thing for you as well. Again, not telling you what to use uh, because your needs may be different. So, how many times have we heard this in the past five, ten years? Right, this is the year of the Linux desktop. Well, it's a dream that we all share, no doubt about that. I think there's a major problem. And I think the major problem is the Linux desktop is not in sync with the design of smartphones. If you look at, uh, now, now why is that important? First, most people today don't use desktop. They use smartphones, or they use a pad, uh, or they use a, a laptop that is mobile, uh, a Chromebook or they use, uh, you know, an Apple Air or something. But they, uh, they, they don't take a, a large laptop with them. Uh, I, I remember when I was traveling at the end, um, I was taking a, 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 just a, an Android pad with me because that's all I needed. <laughs> and when, why carry around a five-pound laptop that's just, and a power supply? That's just dumb. So um, anyway, uh, the smartphone is tied, of course, there are some applications on it. It has some limited storage, but it really depends on the cloud in order to really function as a, as a, uh, as a user interface. So um, you're tied to the cloud, you're tied to the network with a smartphone, so the interfaces are quite different than they are from a desktop. Uh, the interface for a smartphone, of course, is your finger and that uses gestures. There's also an accelerometer in most of them that you can move the screen in orientation and it will change the, the, the display automatically. You can give voice commands to them. Um, can't do, I personally can't do that with my desktop. I can pick up my monitor and turn it, but nothing's gonna happen. I don't have one of those monitors that rotates 90 degrees and then flips the screen, but uh, yeah, I guess it is possible. And it's possible to have touch on a monitor, but it's clumsy. If you have a keyboard, and you're trying to reach way out to the screen, well, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really clumsy. So I think that's one of the bigger problems here is that, uh, is that users are used to the smartphone interface. They're not used to the desktop interface. So you're really asking them to, to learn something that's quite different from what they know. That's why I think we need a fresh approach. Um, I think that the smartphone design should be scaled up to make it a desktop rather than make the desktop uh, trying to conform to what the smartphone looks like, just flip it. And then I think that the smartphone should be part of the desktop. That is, if I want to transfer information, I can just lay it down on, on like on the, on the screen down here at, at the bottom here. I can just lay it down, have it transfer information up or down. Uh, and I think the desktop should be part of the phone as well, that the two are integrated so that information that is stored 
uh, away from the cloud and on my personal machines are stored on the desktop. And then when I want parts of them because I'm traveling, I may want to take a movie with me. Maybe I want to take a set of sound files with me. Maybe there's some drawings I need to take with me or a presentation. I can just take those off of the desktop and go. Or retrieve them later <laughs> if I want to uh, over the network in a secured way. Um, so it's not the user interface that's so much important. It's the user experience that really drives people to come back and use something over and over again. If something is, is difficult to learn or it crashes a lot or it causes them problems and it loses, oh, God forbid, loses, them, loses data for them, that's going to be something they're not going to come back and try a second time. That's my opinion anyway on that. So um, what are the things that there, if you read a lot of people's things on user experiences, they'll tell you it's all over the board. But this is what I think is the most important ones is that the design has to be useful. In other words, it has to be something that that I'm that I, that's going to help me do my job or help me get information or help me be able to produce, in this case, videos. Um, is the design usable? Will it aid me in producing videos? Will it aid me in looking at the internet and doing searches? Will it help me get information uh, downloaded and then uh, dispersed to my phone offline if I need it? Can I find the content that I want? Uh, that's the other issue. Uh, you know, if you think about it and you look at the file managers that we have today, do you know where that comes from? That's right, it comes from file cabinets. How many people have used a file cabinet today? I'll bet not a one. I'll bet not. So why are we still holding on to that user interface? That's, that's dumb. <laughs> if nobody knows, if it was the design of our file systems were to help people transition away from uh, their traditional jobs using file cabinets and filing paper to the computer. They don't need to hold to that paradigm anymore. That's silly. Uh, it shouldn't matter where the files exist on the file system. That, I, mean, I mean, I learned this long ago, that it doesn't matter where the, where the file is on your disk. What matters is, can I get to it? And can I change it? And can I set it back down again? Um, the other thing is, that is the design accessible to anyone? If, I was, if I've had an injury, maybe I was born with uh, uh, some uh, disability or some problem, does it still work for me? You have to be careful that when you're designing things, you're, you're designing it for every, everyone to be able to use it. So that's important. Uh, the other thing is, is, it, is the design valuable? Do I find it of, of not only of use, but do, is, it, is this indispensable in being able to perform my tasks on a daily basis? And maybe my tasks are pretty, you know, maybe they're pretty basic, but... Uh, Whatever those are, I have to perceive value. Otherwise, I'm not coming back to it. If I don't think it's valuable, I'm not going to waste my time learning it. Enough said, right? <laughs> so like I said, I'll leave some links below. I, there's a, a couple of demos I'd like to leave, and maybe you'll look at. Uh, there was one done uh, in the 80s by Apple called the Knowledge Navigator. I want to leave a link for that. There was also one done by Sun in 97 called the Starfire demo. I saw that originally when I was out at, uh, in a conference in 98 with Sun, and uh, I couldn't get into the open step, so I went to that one instead and found it quite fascinating. Um, they, uh, they actually went through. Now, the video only shows two devices, but in the demo that they gave at the conference, well, it was a couple years later. So... They had three devices. They had basically the desktop, uh, what would it be equivalent to a, 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 a pad uh, a, or a tablet? And also they, uh, they had a phone. So they had a mobile device. So they had all those things included in the display. And I think those are kind of interesting, not just from historical purposes, those, the, but of course, you know, from a, a what is possible. And then I'll probably throw some in from the science fiction films because those are always useful, and when you're trying to come up with ideas to look at, I know that uh, in one case, one of my customers wanted to make a gaming interface because it was easier to train users that were coming in that were 17 and 18 year olds. Um, give them a gaming interface and a uh, Xbox controller, and that was the interface to the software, and that's what we did. So it did save a lot of time on the training. I'll, I'll tell you that. So I mean, that's another another idea. Anyway. I'm going to leave you with this quote by Alan Kay. 
Uh, this is the other side of the coin. You don't want to make it so uh, simple that there are no learning curves. And this is what he's talking about. That it's the desire of the consumer to society to have no learning curves. But he said this results in a very dumbed down product that are easy that are, might be easy to get started on, but are totally worthless after you've uh, learned it <laughs> because they don't do anything beyond the point where uh, some basic functions were added. So he's quite right about that. So it's something to think about. Hope you enjoyed today's uh, video. If you did, please like and subscribe. And please, I would love to hear your opinions as well. Hope to see you again real soon and uh, bye for now.